Good morning, Crossings family. It's a delight for us to be together today. Those joining us in all of our rooms, you've heard some wonderful music. And uh, joining us online, you've heard wonderful music. And uh, we're thankful that you're with us. And uh, we're, we're just honored that we can uh, be a part of your life and uh, that you can be with us and, and let us encourage you. Last week, I, I did announce that we had had, so far this year, 300 people baptized, and today we had 100 more, 103, I think, or five, something like that, which is just wonderful when people simply have decided to follow Jesus, that's why we exist, to help people find and follow Jesus, and these are folks who have found him, and they want to be public about it before their church family, and we're thankful that they do that as a testimony. One of the first testimonies we ever give is when we're baptized and in front of our family, Family, our church family, and they can not only celebrate, but we can also walk alongside. So what a wonderful thing it is. Last Sunday, uh, I told you uh, uh, something that I've been wanting to tell you for a while, and it finally happened, and I got a green light, to, a go light last Sunday morning and during the uh, earlier service. And uh, most of you are aware of it now. It's been uh, quite uh, talked about in the media that, uh, you know, back in the spring, I, or early uh, spring, I was driving around the Belle Isle area, and I'm, you know, I got kind of uh, probably a little too sentimental, and I just thought, boy, I'd love to be back down here. That, and our church down there, you know, it's pretty, but it's a wonderful church there now, and, and a wonderful group of people. And I thought, well, I just need to get a, you know, we looked at a few things, and it didn't happen. I said, okay, I got to quit reminiscing, and I got to quit being, you know, all this spine-tingling thinking about the good old days, you know, somewhere. They weren't that good. I did, we did five services on the weekend, so three is great. I, I'll take it. But we finally, uh, someone made a phone call we didn't ask him to make, didn't know they were going to make it. End of that story is um, Mayfair Church of Christ gave us their building. And so uh, it, this is just unheard of. And wonderful people, 92% of the church approved that. They voted yes and we'll be joining together. And uh, someone said, are you going to have acapella music? Hey, we can have any music we want. We'll have, we can, Crossings can do it, and we'll do a little bit of all of it, I'm sure, but uh, it will be a Crossings location in Mayfair, and we're very excited about that. So this has been a great week. So now I wanna give you a quick tour. Uh, Jared Chambers, the pastor, and I think I told you, when I first met him, it's like, no matter where this goes, I'm going to try to pick him off, which is not a very nice thing to do to a church, but I really, really like this guy. So their pastor is going to be one of our pastors on our team, and he gave me a tour this week. So have a look at the screen. You get a feel for what's down at Mayfair. Hey, Crossings family, I'm standing in this incredible, beautiful church that has been the Mayfair Church of Christ since 1958. And we're thankful to be standing here today because this is a place that great things have happened. And these are some wonderful, wonderful people. You can, you can tell the spirit of the church by the banners that you find hanging in this beautiful room. And it says this, love God, love people, share Jesus. And that's what they have been doing and they wanna do even more of it. They have a wonderful pastor that's become a great friend, Jared Chambers. And uh, I want you to kind of share a little bit about what your folks are thinking and how things are going here. Yeah, Marty, as you mentioned, we've had dreams for a long time uh, of having a greater impact uh, in this neighborhood and in the city around us. Uh, and we are really excited to join together with Crossings to make that happen, to be able to reach out more and be able to invite more people in to see the love of Jesus in action. There's a lot of buzz in this area right now with the development coming next door. The timing could not be better. Well, we're excited about it, and I never dreamed that we would get to come back to this area. We started in 1959, over six blocks away from here, I think, at 55th and Lynn. So now to bring Crossings back to this area is a thrill. Crossings, I just ask you to be in prayer, that we will know exactly what God has in mind, and that we'll follow His steps all the way through. I feel like I'm, I'm having a dream. This cannot be true, it cannot be real. And who does this? What, who, who does this? A church and another family tradition giving their church to us and we're going to join together. And this, I think we're gonna be a wonderful testimony to the body of Christ that two different churches can actually be one and work together for the good of a community. And so I'm very excited about that. So um, 
Today, as we get ready uh, for, the, for me to make some comments I'm about to make, I want you to, there's a, a card you got, your weekly when you walked in, and I'd like to ask you to tear it off at the very bottom. Not all of you may need it or use it, but some might, and I would rather all of you be holding one so those who might uh, actually use it and as our, what our intention is, that uh, they would be able to do that uh, in, in complete freedom and have people around them doing the same. Now, August 13th, two weeks ago, I explained what we do, who we are, why we do it, what God has called us to be, a church that will, we, we exist to help people find and follow Jesus, and we want to be people that demonstrate we follow Jesus by living by faith, be a voice of hope, and be known by love. We believe that's the biblical, appropriate thing that we should do as we reach this community. That, so we talked about that on the 13th. Last Sunday, we talked about responding to Jesus with everything in you, everything you have, and to become a generous giver. You invest in God's dream for you, for us, and his church. Now, and, and I, I've been telling you, uh, so much so that I think you may be getting a little tired of hearing it, I'm just not tired of saying it yet, is that there's really been something special happening in this church. It's like it's, like it's new, and, and after four, you know being here 40 years, or 42, you know, it, it, it's, it's new, it's something different, something special, never seen a season quite like it, but we've had a lot of those seasons on the journey from 145 of us down at Belle Isle to what God has been doing for us now and now in these uh, four or five locations. So I, I think today is a time for us to evaluate, um, are, we, are we admirers of Jesus or are we followers of Jesus? And that, if you're a follower, that affects everything. And we cannot be what God's preparing us to be if we don't have more people willing to be a follower and certainly in the area of our giving. We did that last Sunday. Today, I invite those of you who may not have had an opportunity before to follow Jesus to give you that opportunity. You don't have to come to the front. You'll just let us know through the card that you have in your hands, or you can come to the front. Our prayer teams will be in the front of our rooms, and you can come to the uh, the front of all the rooms to, to have prayer with a prayer team member about anything that may be on your mind, whether it's uh, your first uh, move toward God or not. I heard a song earlier this year. Uh, you know, I love music. Um, and boy, am I thankful that um, every room you're in today, all the locations have wonderful, phenomenal music. And I love that about our church. And we have some wonderful uh, musicians, we have wonderful worship leaders who happen to also be as humble as they are talented. And that's a, that's a rare find. And so I'm very thankful for that. So, I, you know, when I buy a car, I buy the music system and then the rest of it's fine as long as it runs. So, well, I, I'm a little more into cars than that. So uh, just to be honest. So, but music system is very important because I love music. I love listening to music and I listen to it when I'm by myself in the car at a fairly high level of volume. And so uh, if you're at a stoplight and I'm next to you, I'm gonna be the car you hear, the bass booming and all that kind of thing. That's me. So I listened to this song earlier this year and I have not been able to let it go. Uh, there are great songs that have a grip on me. I still love songs that I first heard in the 60s and 70s from wonderful uh, Christian uh, singers and writers. And so this one just got a hold of me. So I wanna read you the words. I just feel like a sailboat. Don't know where I'm headed, but you can't make the wind blow from a sailboat. I've seen the sun, felt the rain on my skin. I've been lost and found, but mostly I've been waiting. I'm out in the waves, I'm hoping and praying, please let this wind blow me home. Night after night, there's an empty horizon. My God, do I feel so alone? But sometimes life, and most times, I just feel like a sailboat. And I sure I'm heard, at least I know I'm speaking, but I feel like a fool because I can't hear you listening. Have you ever said that to God before? I wish I could hear you listening. But I'm not giving up. I'm gonna move on forward. I'm gonna raise my sail. God knows what I'm headed towards. The only change I see, lost or found at sea, the only difference is believing I will make it in. Believing I will make it in. So 
When I first heard this song, of course, I can't stop playing it. I still do. It reminds me of life. Some of you remember, or you may be there now, being, feeling alone in a frightening place, like a sailboat waiting for the wind to take you to shore. You found out God is listening. You're being heard. And you raised your sail, and God got you home. Some of you are adrift in a sea. Maybe you don't realize the danger you're in. And maybe you think you can figure out how to get home or get to shore on your own. But if you're a sailboat, it takes the wind. Some of you are running from something. And maybe life is adrift in the sea. Maybe that sounds pretty good, actually, sometimes. Some of you think you don't need God to get back to sanity, to get back to the shore. And some of you may think you don't even need the wind. But if you're a sailboat, you're not going anywhere without the wind. Today, I want to help you get clear about your beliefs and actions and attitudes and habits. I want to invite you to become a fully committed follower of Jesus Christ. It's an exhilarating journey. I can assure you, I've experienced it. And the longer you follow, the more exciting it gets. I want to talk to you about where you stand with Jesus. Is he God? Is he a prophet? A famous teacher? Do you realize what your life could be if you gave your life to the one who made you? Who will be with you in every step and every decision, most of which will be the complete opposite of sometimes what we think is normal or routine. Would you like to discover what it's like to live the Ephesians 3.20 life that says God can do anything you know, far more than you could ever ask for or imagine or guess or request in your wildest dreams? He does it not by pushing us around, but by working within us. His spirit deeply and gently within us. That's Ephesians 3, 20 and 21. Let me read you a familiar passage. You've probably heard it. John chapter 3. For God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God sent his son into the world not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. There is no judgment against anyone who believes in him. Are you an admirer or follower? I heard a great message from John Ortberg many years ago. I've never forgotten that. Do we admire Jesus or are we following Jesus? What category do you find yourself in? An admirer is impressed. A follower is devoted. An admirer applauds. A follower surrenders life. A lot of people admired Martin Luther King. Some marched with him. Not many went to jail with him. Not many go to their houses getting bombed like he did. A lot of people admired Mother Teresa, but not many people followed her to live among the destitute and dying. Follower, admirer. When Jesus gave this talk in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, verse 28, it says they, were, uh, uh, they finished these things and the crowds were amazed when Jesus quit talking. And there were two groups of people listening to him. He saw the crowds. There was a crowd of people. They went on the mountainside. They went up to the mountainside. His disciples came to him and he began to teach. And again, one part of the group is the crowd. And, and there are a lot of them. They're very impressed by Jesus. In fact, that's where the verse comes from in verse 28 of Matthew 7. Very clear. When Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority. It's like he knew what he was talking about, not as their teachers of the law. It's very different. The whole crowd admired Jesus, but while he's teaching, something began to happen in the hearts of we don't know how many. There were thousands possibly gathered that day, and it went beyond admiration to where they said, what I'm hearing is something I need, and I want to know more about it. This is it. This is what I've been longing for. This is what I've been waiting for. To be clean, to be loved, to be forgiven, to be reminded that somebody loves me knowing everything about me. And that somebody who loves us will never throw it back in our faces. The enemy will, 
The devil will. He loves to remind us of something we did that we regret. Not Jesus. I would rather have what this man has, they said, and give up everything else in the world than to have everything the world could offer me and give up this man. In John chapter three, a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a religious leader, comes to Jesus at night. Now, some would criticize that because maybe he came as an admirer. He probably did. But Jesus didn't seem to mind that it was night. Jesus didn't seem to say to him, oh, so you're too ashamed to come to me in the daytime? That's not what Jesus said. So however you want to, whenever you want to come, whenever you want to talk, let's talk. And some of you probably feel the same way. I think I grew up in church and there was only one way, and, and I'm not criticizing it, it worked for me, okay? I grew up in a wonderful home, my dad was a pastor, and my brother and I still love Jesus. That is an amazing thing, because a lot of preachers' kids when they graduate from high school run as fast and far away from the church as they can get. And yes, in those days you, when you became a Christian, it, it had to be right at the end of a service, during a song, at an altar, down front. Now I later learned that as I got into my teenage years, Jesus is everywhere. Everywhere. So Nicodemus came at night. We're told in the text that he came to Jesus by night and he said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher who's come from God. He's an admirer at this point. For no one could do these miracles if God were not in them. So he's admiring Jesus. You must have come from God, Nicodemus said. So when, but, but let me tell you what happened to this, this conversation. Started as an admirer and got to where he was following because it was Nicodemus who publicly asked if he could take the body of Jesus from the cross and give him a proper burial. from admirer to follower. And anybody in that day who had just witnessed a crucifixion could really logically believe if they messed with this, they could be next. Nicodemus was not afraid to ask. He loved this man. His life had changed. Nicodemus had it all, but he didn't have Jesus. And when he became a follower, Everything changes. That's true for all of us. This whole end of the Sermon on the Mount is a series of pictures that Jesus gives, and every one of them uh, involves this stark contrast designed to force people to choose. John Ortberg painted it this way. There's a narrow gate, there's a wide gate, no third gate. There's, there's a narrow road and a broad road, no third road. There's a good tree and a bad tree, no third tree. There are true disciples and there are false disciples, no third category. You're one or the other. There's a house built on a rock and a house built on the sand, no third house. People who do what Jesus says and people who hear and know but do not seek it are missing something. The people who follow Jesus and go from admirer to follower who hear the word and they say something is different about this man and something is different about me. Admirer, follower. So I want to do something, uh, run through a couple of steps, and this will help you kind of assess where you are spiritually. And I think it's only fair that you have a chance to do this. And so there's, it's five simple words, and I'm going to give these to you now. Knowledge is the first word. And the question we ask ourselves, am I learning more about the content and meaning of the Bible? And you, you cannot be at crossings without running into a Bible study every day somewhere, sometimes all over town in office buildings, at restaurants, here in our locations. But you need to ask yourself, am I learning more about the content and meaning of the Bible? And here's, here's the way I've kind of always felt about the Bible, among other things, is that the Bible tells me all the wonderful things, that, kind of like the benefits, the upside of following Jesus. Why wouldn't anybody want to know that? The Bible reminds me that there's something that, that I need to deal with in my life. The Bible reminds me occasionally that there's someone that I've said something to that shouldn't have been said, or I've thought something, or I've gossiped about them. It's the Bible that, that convicts me and says, okay, you need, to go, you need to go get that clear. So are you learning more about the content and meaning of the Bible? This is great from Proverbs. 
The Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He grants a treasure of common sense to the, to the honest. He's a shield to those who walk with integrity. To the New Testament, Colossians 3. Let the word of God dwell in you richly. Am I learning more about the content and meaning of the Bible? Number two, perspective. Am I seeing more clearly from God's point of view? In other words, what used to annoy you or people that you used to try to avoid, are you finding a heart softening a bit toward things? Maybe toward people that have hurt you. And all of a sudden you're considering, you know, if I've been forgiven, how can I not forgive someone else? Am I seeing more clearly from God's point of view? But we have the mind of Christ. What a gift. It's Colossians 3.16. We have the mind of Christ. Number three, convictions. Am I valuing more of what is important to God? And just, just a side note, folks. It is so good for me to go through these five steps. It's, it's kind of like a little inventory you make. It's kind of something every now and then you just have to take a look at it and say, okay, now, it's exciting to be a part of a great church. It's exciting to worship. It's exciting to do great things. It's exciting to volunteer and, and really get to, into the lives of people that are broken and hurting and assume the church would want nothing to do with them. I love that stuff. But am I, am I learning more? Am I seeing more clearly? Am I valuing more what God values? Am I valuing the people around me or around you or in the neighborhood or, or the office who drive you crazy and you really can't stand them, but do you, can you value them as God does? Are you valuing what God values? Don't copy the behavior and customs of the world. Let God transform you into a new person. How? Look at this. By changing the way you think. It changes the way you think. And when you do that, there'll be some people that think you've jumped off a cliff somewhere or you've lost your mind. Depends on how serious you get about it. I love this phrase. If you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. You will fall for anything. Number four is character. Am I becoming more like Christ? Romans 8, 29, from the beginning, God decided that those who came to him should become like his son. So as Jesus loved us unconditionally, as Jesus told us the hard truth at times, am I that person for others around me? Am I becoming more like Christ? And then number five, skills. Am I doing better what God made me to do? You can read through Romans and in Corinthians, the, the, the spiritual gifts that we all are given. There's something God has equipped all of us to do. It may be a talent we have. It may be just something that we know that we can do and we're confident in it and we're glad to do it. Now, there's plenty of time in church life when you do something because it needs to be done. Whether you feel like you're qualified or not. There are times we all have to do some heavy lifting together. And this church has been doing this now for, you know, 64 years. 65 years, I think, because they're as old as I am. I'm 64 Carla Hinton in the religion news of the Oklahoman did a great interview with Jason, uh, Jared and I. And I got a kick out of it. In Thursday's edition, when they released it to Friday's edition, they were mentioning me and Jared. And they said, Pastor Grubbs, 64. And then Jared, they didn't mention his age. <laughs> didn't say a word about him being 37. It was obvious. He's old, he's young. That's how I took it anyway. Okay, where was I going with that? All right. So, as we follow Christ, and as, as we are part of a church family that sticks with you through every season of life, am I doing better what God has made me to do? A spiritual gift is given to each of us. Why? So we can help each other. That's why. So, I invite you to do an assessment of your spiritual life. How is it with you and Jesus? Are you admiring him? It's easy to admire, frankly. Or are you following? That's up to you. Only you can answer that question. But I wanted to say, if you're admiring, I'd love you to take the next step. Because that's where the excitement begins. 
when you follow him. When you follow him. Three steps, three simple things I want to just ask you to consider. One, you've got to believe he exists. Now, that's easy for me in many ways. Not because I grew up in church, but, and I've told you before, having been over in Jerusalem and in the Holy Lands, walking where Jesus walked, I got baptized a second time. I, I, could, I probably could have been baptized three or four times before it really took, but I got baptized in the Jordan River where Jesus got baptized. And when you're looking at it, when you're reading this, the verse about it, when you're reading a chapter in the Bible and you're looking at it, that'll do something for your faith. If there's any doubt, that'll do something for you. Believe he exists. Matthew 7, we have a chance, Jesus tells us, you can build your life on the rock or you can build it on sand. Only choice, rock, sand. And we're the ones that decide which ones it's gonna be. So you gotta believe he exists and then secondly, then you choose to follow. Jesus said it, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way Take up your cross daily and follow me. Now, some people are so afraid that this means, oh boy, I, I've, got to, I've got to be weird. <laughs> I've got to be weird, you know. <clears throat> oh boy, is God going to, as a kid growing up in church, I was afraid when missionaries came, you know, from the farthest parts of the world, when, when they came from Africa and they'd sell their slides and then they want all of us to become a missionary. I was petrified. I would say, God, I know you really I love you, but I don't want to be a missionary. <laughs> I really don't want to go to Africa. And then I've been other places, but that's what God does. You believe he exists. You choose to follow. It's your choice. No one can do it for you. And then with that, then you spend time with him. Why do we want to read a Bible every day? Why do we want to do, have some kind of a devotional life throughout the day? To remind us of the incredible benefit we have from being a follower of Jesus. The love he has for us. The, the wisdom he brings in our lives. He said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Let me teach you, because I'm humble and gentle at heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And yes, it's hard to follow someone you've never seen. But it's, it's not too bad to love someone who has a record of how he loved everybody. Everybody. Just read the Bible and talk about the prodigal son. The son who's been out and destroying his life. And the father runs to him when he sees him coming back home. Woman at the well. <clears throat> Jesus said, you've had five, five husbands and you're living with a guy you're not married to. <clears throat> she said, yeah, you're right. They have this discussion, and, here's, and I say this all the time. I know you get tired of hearing it, but I don't get tired of saying it. <clears throat> the last part of that story said many in the community came to know Jesus because of this woman's testimony. Most churches wouldn't let her teach Sunday school, ever. But God used her when, she got, when, it, when it took hold in her. Many people in that town came to believe in Jesus because of her testimony. Follower or admirer, squeeze him in when you have time or follow him. It may not mean much in your life changes, it's changed your focus. It will change the why you do what you do. It'll change what you may do in your life. And then and, and John Ortberg, again, I love this guy. He'll be with us in a few weeks. We do not drift into becoming the best version of ourselves. You don't drift there like a sailboat without the wind. We can't do that. So back to the sailboat, this song that I love. I want you to hear it. I want you to have the experience I had the first time I heard it. And some great people are, are in our worship area are coming to the stage and they're going to sing this for everybody. All the rooms, all the locations. But I'm not giving up, it says. The guy in the sailboat, I'm not giving up. I'm gonna move on forward. I love this. I'm gonna raise my sail. God knows what I'm headed towards. 
The only change I see, lost or found at sea, the only difference is believing I'll make it in. So I'm saying to you folks, whether you've been a believer a long time or you're considering it right now, raise the sail and let God take you where only he can take you. And you will never regret it. I'm gonna pray, then we'll listen to this song. Father, thank you so much for the clarity and simplicity of helping us understand what it means to follow Jesus. Soften our hearts. Give us room in our minds to consider things perhaps we've not considered before. I pray for those who today are ready to come home to the shore. In Jesus' name.